Let's take our seats. Take them where they are. Sit in them. <laughs> uh, we're going to be in Micah tonight, chapter 3. We left off last week. We finished uh, chapters 1 and 2 of Micah. Um, we've been wait, making our way through the Minor Prophets. It's been exciting for me. This, this is my first time teaching through all of the Minor Prophets, and so it's been just interesting as I teach through these and uh, grow in my understanding of them and have the Lord revealing things to my heart as I'm studying through them. It's, it's been exciting for me. It's been exciting. As we, as we move into it tonight, we're going to see uh, just a glimpse of that millennial kingdom that we're going to see together with the Lord as we're going to read through Micah chapter 4, hopefully tonight. We'll see how far we get, but we have to get through chapter 3 first, so I don't know. We'll see. But before we do that, turn with me to Psalm 144. Psalm 144. So, Psalm 144 is a special psalm for me. And this is just where I ended up today in my quiet time with the Lord and, and as I was studying His Word. And it's special to me because it's been a, it's been a section of Scripture, Psalm 144.1 specifically, that I've carried with me for a long time. And I have even... This will sound funny, but it, before, long before I was walking with the Lord, I memorized and would quote Psalm 144.1 because I thought it sounded really cool. And I had it like written on things on my shorts. I would have Psalm 144.1 across my shorts and just like because I thought it sounded really tough. And then today, as I was reading Psalm 144, um, it means something completely different to me now than it used to. And as I read it, it hits me in a completely different way than it used to hit me. The truth is it's still very cool. It still sounds really cool. But it's different when you know the Lord. It's different when you trust in the Lord. It's different when you've been walking with him for a little while. And this is, this is a psalm that I've always had in my mind and I've carried around and today, when I was reading it, I felt like I read it for the first time ever. And so I wanted to just share it with you before we get into Micah. I wanted to just share what the Lord was speaking to me uh, in my quiet time this morning. And so, if you're with me, Psalm 144, verse 1. And this is a Psalm of David. And so, you guys know the story of David, most of you. And if you don't, I would read First and Second Samuel so you get to know David very intimately because he's an amazing character in Scripture. He is a type or a shadow, foreshadowing of Christ. And David, his throne is established forever in Jesus. Jesus is through the lineage of David. He's the fulfillment of the root of Jesse. He is uh, seated on the throne of David. And so the more you get to know David, uh, the more amazing he is as a man and as a king. But David had a lot of failures as well. David was uh, a man after God's own heart, and, but he was also a man. He was also a failure in a lot of ways. But when you read Psalm 44, 1, it's in, uh, Psalm 144 in general, but especially when you start with verse 1, it's important to understand the context, and it's important to understand who David is. David is a warrior king. He is a man of war. He's a man of blood. And because of that, the Lord wouldn't allow him to build the temple that he was going to use his son Solomon because his hands weren't stained with blood like David's were. And so when David writes this verse, this first verse, he says, Blessed is the Lord my rock who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. Now David could say this from a place of really understanding and knowing what warfare is, what battle is, so far down to the, so he knows it so intimately, so well that the Lord even trains his fingers. Now listen, if you've ever been in a real fight, if you've ever been in a fight for your life, if you've ever been in a, in a, a serious fight, then when you're getting trained all the way down to your fingers, you're talking about some serious fighting, right? David says, not only is the Lord training my hands for war, but my fingers for battle. Every single part of me is trained and moved by the Lord for this battle, for fighting. But look at this. Look at what he says after that. Now, that's where I stopped. I just want you to know. That's where I stopped 
before I was really walking with the Lord. Just verse 1, because that was the end of the cool part for me. Okay? But now, when I, after I've been walking with the Lord, verse 2 is where the actual cool part starts. Blessed is the Lord my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. Now, when you think about David, you think about a lot of things, right? I do, anyway. My mind goes to a, a, a warrior. My mind goes to a king, a leader, a man, right? A man's man that men would want to follow. But you know what David is known for the most? The Psalms. He's a poet, a songwriter. He played the harp. He wrote poetry. He was a warrior. He was a man. He was a king. But he was a man of worship whose heart was tuned to the Lord who loved to sit with the Lord and worship him, even when it seemed crazy to everyone else. He would just worship. Now, when you think about what it means to be trained for war and what, do you mean, what it means to be trained for battle as a Christian, as a believer in Jesus, that is who he is to us. That is who the Lord is to us. He's our rock, and he trains our hands for war and our fingers for battle. But what does the war look like? It doesn't look like the mighty men of David who are slaying men by the hundreds so much so that their hand would stick to their sword, and they would kill men until their arm wearied, and they couldn't kill them anymore. That's not what we look like. What do we look like? We are fighting. We are in a battle. We are trained for war by the Lord. But what is the warfare? It's for the hearts of men. It's for the kingdom. And so David goes on to explain the first verse. Blessed be the Lord who is my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. Listen to this. My loving kindness. Man. And my fortress. My high tower and my deliverer. My shield. And the one in whom I take refuge, who subdues my people under me. I want you to notice what David doesn't say in verse 2. He doesn't say, who is like a fortress. He doesn't say, the Lord who is like a high tower, like a deliverer. He doesn't say that. He says, the Lord is literally my loving kindness. That's who he is. That's who the Lord is. He is my loving kindness and my fortress. He's my high tower and my deliverer and my shield. Now listen, David knows a lot about practical warfare. He knows a lot about practical man-to-man -man fighting. But he recognizes that the warfare that he's in is so much more than flesh and blood. And it takes a whole lot more than being skilled and trained for fighting to win this war. He says, the Lord is my fortress. He's the one that I run to in my time of trouble. He's the one when the enemy is pressing in around me, when the world is coming against me, when the accusations are coming and pressing in, I can run to him and be safe. I'm safe in him. It doesn't matter what the world says. It doesn't matter what your enemy is plotting and planning against you. If you can be with the Lord, he is your high tower. You're safe in him. You're far above the attack, the attack of the enemy. You're looking down. As the enemy is pursuing you, when you're with the Lord, you are in a high tower. Unreachable by enemy forces. He's my fortress, my high tower, and my deliverer. My shield. Listen to this. And the one in whom I take refuge, who subdues my people under me. Verse 3. Lord, what is man that you take knowledge of him, or the son of man that you are mindful of him? Man is like a breath. His days are like a passing shadow. I love this because in verse 3 and 4, I, I see awe in David. I see awe as he considers the Lord, as he considers who he is, as he's considering what the Lord has done in him and for him. And then he has this moment, this recognition of awe as he's worshiping the Lord for who he is. He's my high tower, 
my deliverer, my fortress, my shield, the one in whom I take refuge. He subdues my people under me. I'm recognizing the majesty and the greatness of God. And then all of a sudden, David comes to the realization in this psalm, and he says, who am I that you would even care? Because he shouldn't. When you consider who the Lord is, when you consider that he holds the hearts of kings in his hand, that he breathed everything that you see into existence and everything unseen, that he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and he declares the end from the beginning. He is the King above all kings, the Lord above all lords, and at his name every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that he is Lord. Some to glory and some to shame. And that's who he is. And yet, here we are on a ball of dust in a universe so big that we can't even conceive it with our mind. And we're just one little speck in all of space. And yet, the Lord inclines his ear to my cry. <laughs> yet he's mindful of me. Lord, what is man? What am I that you take knowledge of me? Or the son of man that you are mindful of him? Listen, man is like a breath. His days are like a passing shadow. Man is like a breath. It's a vapor. Bow down your heavens, O Lord, and come down. Touch the mountains and they shall smoke. Flash forth lightning and scatter them. Shoot out your arrows and destroy them. Stretch out your hand from above. Listen, rescue me and deliver me out of great waters from the hand of foreigners whose mouth speaks lying words and whose right hand is a right hand of falsehood. I will sing a new song to you, O God. On a harp of ten strings, I will sing praises to you. The one who gives salvation to kings, who delivers David his servant from the deadly sword. Rescue me and deliver me from the hand of foreigners whose mouth speaks lying words and whose right hand is a right hand of falsehood. That our sons may be as plants grown up in their youth. That our daughters may be as pillars sculpted in palace style. That our barns may be full, supplying all kinds of produce. That our sheep may bring forth thousands and ten thousands in our fields. That our oxen may be well laden. That there will be no breaking in or going out. There, there will be no outcry in our streets. Happy are the people who are in such a state. Happy are the people whose God is the Lord, whose God is Yahweh. Man, I look at this psalm and I think about David and the warrior that he was and the king that he was, and the victories and the failures. And yet in all of that, this is how David fights. This is how he goes to war. It's not, it's not just the war against men and the war against foreigners and people. It's the war against the actual enemy of our souls. And the way we go to battle is through worship. The way we go to battle is by recognizing who our God is, recognizing that we're safe in him and that he is our high tower, that we can run to him in times of trouble, that we can trust in him as a fortress and that he is our shield and he is the one who delivers us from the hand of the enemy. He is the one who delivers us from the ones who speak lying words about us and it's his glory. Man, he deserves it all. And what are we? What are we that he's mindful of us? Man, it's amazing to consider who we are in light of who he is, and yet he loves us. How insignificant we are in light of how great he is, and yet he wants a relationship with us. So before we get into Micah, what I want to do is I just want to give you guys a moment to pray, to set your heart on the Lord to set your heart on his goodness, to set your heart on, on how he cares for us, how he's cared for you so far, even though you don't deserve it. And I just want to have tonight, as we study his word, just an attitude of, of humble gratefulness before the Lord.
of just an attitude of worship. You guys pray. Lord, we just thank you for another night to come and to sit at your feet. Lord, to be in awe of you as David is. Lord, who are we that you care for us, that you're mindful of us, and yet and yet you meet us here every day, every night, every Sunday, every Wednesday, every time we come together. You're here in our midst, Lord, and you meet with us and you speak to us through your word. You counsel us. You grow us. You transform us into your image and likeness, Lord. Father, we pray tonight that as we study your word, you would just bring us closer. Just bring us closer to you, Lord. Align our hearts to your heart and our will to your will. God, that we would look like you. That we would reflect you in our lives. Uh, Lord, that we would live lives set apart from the world sanctified unto you, Lord, in holiness so that the world would want to know you more. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're going to pick up in in, uh, chapter 3, Micah chapter 3, if you want to turn there with me. Uh, We finished last week at the end of chapter 2 where um, we have this glimpse of Jesus, right? We have this messianic proclamation at the end of Micah chapter 2 where we get a glimpse of Israel being restored. For the first two chapters, Micah has been pronouncing judgment against uh, Jacob, against Israel and Jerusalem. And he's been speaking of the judgment that is to come as a result of of, uh, them falling away, their spiritual adultery, right? But at the end of chapter 2, we see this restoration promise of the house of Israel. In verse 12, he says, I will surely assemble all of you, O Jacob. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together like Sheep of the fold, like a flock in the midst of their pasture, they shall make a loud noise because of so many people. The one who breaks open, that's Jesus, the breaker, the one who breaks open will come up before them. They will break out, pass through the gate, and go out by it. Their king will pass before them with the Lord at their head. I love that. This is, this is a future promise for the house of Israel, this promise of restoration. Even though the Lord is going to bring Israel into judgment, he says, look, there's going to be a day of reconciliation. There's going to be a day of restoration. And the breaker, the one who goes before you, the one who breaks open, uh, you, you guys know last week I told you that this is a term used for the lead shepherd as they were going through rough terrain and leading their flocks through rough terrain. The breaker would go before the flock, clearing a path so that the flock could pass safely through. That's Jesus. Look what he says. Their king will pass before them with the Lord at their head. The one who breaks open is the one who is at their head, right? The one who breaks open is the one leading the flock. And here he says, the Lord will be at their head. Now you guys know because you're students of the word, that when you see L-O-R-D in all capital letters, that means it's the covenant name of God. This is Yahweh at their head. Now, this is important because nowhere in the New Testament that I've ever found do you find a place where it talks about the Father coming to earth and ruling and reigning on earth. It's only ever Jesus, right? It's only ever the Son. The Son comes to rule and reign. He comes back during the millennial reign of Christ. He's ruling and reigning with a rod of iron from Jerusalem. Bodily, practically, physically, he's here on earth. The second coming of Jesus is when he comes and puts his feet 
on earth to rule and reign in power and glory, right? We see that happening in Revelation 19. We see Jesus riding back to earth. He throws the beast and the false prophet into the lake of fire. He binds Satan and puts him in the bottomless pit for a thousand years, and he rules and reigns on earth. Now, for us as Christians, yeah, no kidding. Why, why does this matter? Well, for, let's say, Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon who doesn't believe that Jesus is actually God, this is a problem verse because here it says that Yahweh is going to be here on earth leading Israel. He is the breaker. Well, who is that? In the New Testament, that's Jesus. He's the fulfillment of this. Jesus is coming back to rule and reign. Jesus is coming back bodily to rule and reign from Jerusalem. But the problem is Micah says that's going to be Yahweh. Well, for us that hold to the Trinity, it's no problem at all. Jesus is Yahweh. Jesus is Jehovah God. That's who he is. And so here with the Lord at their head. Then picking up in chapter 3, this is uh, Micah speaking. And I said... Hear now, O heads of Jacob, and you rulers of the house of Israel. Is it not for you to know justice? Now he's asking this kind of inflammatory question to the rulers of Israel, to the rulers of the house of Jacob. He says, isn't it for you to know justice? Isn't that why you're in power? Isn't that why you're ruling over the people of Israel? Because you know justice, right? You who hate good and love evil. Who strip the skin from my people and the flesh from their bones. Who also eat the flesh of my people, flay their skin from them, break their bones, and chop them in pieces like meat for the pot, like flesh in the cauldron. He's saying of these leaders, these supposed uh, rulers of Jerusalem and Israel, the ones who are, supposed to, who, who are supposed to know justice, the ones who are supposed to do the right thing, he's saying that not only do they not know justice, not only do they not do the right thing, but they actually hate good and love evil. Now, I, I made this connection a little bit last week, and I think it's important that we recognize it today, that those who are in control... Who, who run things, they hate good and love evil. Uh, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Look at what's happening because of this law that was passed in Texas that I talked about on Sunday, this heartbeat law, this what I think is a, a wonderful law that just got passed. And yet there's this huge outcry against it. This huge outcry against this law in Texas that pr protects the sanctity of human life that says that these babies in the womb deserve rights and they are true human beings that should be uh, um, cared for. I mean, that seems like common knowledge. That seems like common sense, right? That we should care for babies. And yet, when this law is passed... People are outcrying against it, protesting it, and saying that abortion saves lives. That's, that's literally signs that I saw, protest signs, abortion saves lives. All the while, the satanic tabernacle is suing the state of Texas, saying that, no, 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 we have a religious right to abortion, to our, uh, our abortion ritual. And they're claiming those abortions as human sacrifices to Satan. Yeah, it's wild. And yet, people are still blind to it. People still can't see the reality of it. And here it says, look, you're supposed to know justice, justice but you hate good and love evil. Not only that, you're devouring my people. You're stripping the skin from my people. And the flesh from their bones. You're eating the flesh of my people. Flay their skin from them. Break their bones. Chop them in pieces like meat for the pot. Like flesh in the cauldron. This is not literal language. They're not actually cannibals. He's saying that you are devouring my people. As unrighteous rulers who don't know justice. Who hate good and love evil. You are devouring the people of this land. There's nothing left. Verse 4. Then, then they will cry to the Lord. 
These, these supposed rulers, the ones who are supposed to know justice, the ones who hate good, love evil, who are sinning against the Lord, then they, those people, will cry to the Lord, but he will not hear them. He will even hide his face from them at that time because they have been evil in their deeds. Verse 5, thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who make my people stray, who chant peace while they chew with their teeth, but who prepare war against them, who puts nothing into their mouths. Therefore, you shall have night without vision, and you shall have darkness without divination. The sun shall go down on the prophets, and the day shall be dark for them. So the seers shall be ashamed, and the diviners abashed. Indeed, they shall all cover their lips, for there is no answer from God. Listen, there are a lot of people who call themselves prophets. <clears throat> I would say anybody who gives themselves a title like that, you should be wary of. I'm not saying that they're necessarily always untrue, but you should just be wary, you should be discerning, because these people are called prophets of God, and yet they're speaking and telling people that everything is okay. They're chanting peace, and yet they're devouring the people. They're chanting peace, but they're chewing with their teeth and prepare war against him. They put nothing into their mouths, and because of that, they're going to be judged. And the judgment will be that they will not hear from the Lord. They're not going to hear from him. But truly, I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord. I love that, man. This is Micah speaking. I read this verse and it just gives me chills when I read it. Because Micah is saying tough things. Micah is saying difficult things. And he's bringing charges against people in power. Which, if you haven't noticed in history, is a dangerous thing to do. Especially for the prophets. They were almost all killed, beheaded, stoned to death. And Micah knows it. Listen, listen Micah's a country boy, okay? He's, he's prophesying at the same time as Isaiah. Isaiah is from Jerusalem. He's a city boy. Here comes Micah prophesying contemporary with Isaiah, but he's made of something different. I'm not saying he's better. He's just made of something different, okay? And he comes on the scene, and he recognizes what might happen because of this, but he's not afraid. Look at what he says. But truly, I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord. He's not bragging here. Micah's not saying, look at me and how great I am. I'm speaking on behalf of the Lord, and I'm a wonderful prophet of God. That's not what he's saying. He recognizes that this might cost him everything. He's recognizing that this is a difficult thing to do, but he's not afraid. Why? Not because he's tough. Not because he's got it all figured out. Why? Because he's empowered by the Spirit of God. He's full of the Spirit. But truly, I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord and of justice and might to declare to Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. I, I honestly think in, in these verses, it, it makes me think that this is not easy for Micah to do. These are his countrymen. These are his people. He loves them. And yet he's coming against them and saying, look, this is the transgression of the house of Jacob, the house of Israel. This is your sin. And so he says, I'm full of power by the spirit of the Lord and of justice and might to be able to do this job. It's difficult for him. Now hear this, you heads of the house of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel who abhor justice and pervert all equity, who build up Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with iniquity. Her heads judge for a bribe, her priests teach for pay, and her prophets divine for money. Man, this is the, the depth of the corruption that's going on in, in Zion, in Jerusalem, in Israel right now. He's saying, look, this is who you are. Her heads judge for a bribe. Corrupt judges. They're not judging righteously. They're not judging justly. They've been given a job appointed by God, and they've spit on him. They've done exactly opposite of what he's put them in place to do, and they're judging corruptly. He says her, judges, her heads judge for a bribe. They're trying to get rich. They're taking bribes, and they're passing unjust judgments. Her priests teach for pay. 
those who were put in place by God to give instruction for the people of God to read his word and to, and, and to, to preach it rightly, to give insight to the people, to give the sense of the word of God to the people who need to know it, and yet they're teaching for pay. They're just saying what people want them to say so that they can get more money. Never heard of anything like that, right? Her pastors teach for pay. And her prophets divine for money. And yet, even though this is where their heart is, even, this is, even though this is what they're doing, yet they lean on the Lord and say... Is not the Lord among us? No harm can come upon us. How prideful. How prideful of these men to stand in this position of authority given to them by God and to spit and sin against him, to war against what he actually wants them to do and to do the exact opposite. And yet they lean on the Lord and say, well, isn't the Lord among us? No harm can come to us. We're the Lord's anointed. Here we are. The Lord put us here. What can really come against us? And yet they're not walking with him at all. Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed like a field. Jerusalem shall become heaps of ruins. And the mountain of the temple like the bare hills of the forest. And th listen, this has been fulfilled. This happened exactly the way the Lord said it would happen. Assyria comes into northern Israel. They completely decimate it. They wipe out all of Samaria, northern Israel, all the tribes of northern Israel, the northern ten tribes. They take them away captive into Assyria. And then sometime later, Babylon comes into to Judah, into Jerusalem. They completely ransack the city of Jerusalem and all the surrounding cities. They take away captive the men of Jerusalem. They come three times in three deportations of the people of Israel. And then what happens? They destroy the temple and the city completely. It is ruins. There's nothing. Nothing left. Not only that, but then fast forward some time later after the rebuilding of the temple. And what happens when the Romans finally get tired of, of the people of Israel in Jerusalem? What do they do? Destroy the city again. Not only do they destroy the city and the temple, they destroy the temple again. But they roll every single stone of the temple, off of the Temple Mount. If you go to Jerusalem today, which I've never been, but I hope to go one day, my, my pastor always says that um, he'll probably go again when the Lord remodels the place, and that's probably when I'll get to go too. But if you go to Jerusalem today and you visit the Temple Mount, which you, a lot of people do, is there a temple up there? No. Is there one stone of the temple up there? No. You know what's there? A mosque. The Dome of the Rock. They rolled every single stone off the Temple Mount. And guess what? When you go to the side of the Temple Mount and you look over, guess what's there? The stones. They're still there. But the mountain of the temple, like a bare hill of the forest. Nothing there. Now listen. That's a heavy chapter. In, in fact, the first three chapters are very difficult. I love how the Lord does this in his word. I love how... In almost all of the minor prophets, as you read these, these serious passages of judgment, difficult passages of judgment to read, as God pronounces judgment on his people and says, look, because of your sin, because of the way you've departed from me, this is coming against you. And it is heavy and difficult. And yet he always gives us these, like, moments of relief, right? Because at the end of chapter 2, he said, he gives us this restoration of Israel. That Israel will be restored. And he sh shows us this messianic promise that the breaker is going to come. He's going to lead his people through the gate. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. And then he goes back into chapter 3 and starts talking about all this judgment that's going to come upon Israel again because of their corrupt leaders. Because of you, this is going to happen. Because of you, Jerusalem will be taken captive. Because of you, the city will be destroyed and the mountain of God like a bare hill of the forest. This is going to happen. But then we move into chapter 4. And chapter 4 is glorious. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days. Now that right there is an important uh, few words. Half a verse. First part of a verse. It's important. When you hear that, your ears should perk up a little bit. 
Because just so you know, we are in the latter days. That's where we are. That's where we are right now in the last days, in the latter days, in the end times. That's where we are right now. Okay? And it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills. And peoples shall flow to it. Many nations shall come and say, Come, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion the law shall go forth, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples and rebuke strong nations afar off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But everyone shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. For all people walk, each in the name of his God, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. Whew. Man, I love that verse. I, I love this chapter. I, I love this section. Listen to what he's saying. Listen to what Micah is promising the people of Israel. But not only just the people of Israel, but in this prophecy, he's promising something to us and to every nation of the earth. He says, now it shall come to pass in the latter days. That means that those first three chapters are speaking of judgment, the judgment that is coming upon Israel now, this imminent judgment upon the nation of Israel, that there's going to be nations that come against the nation of Israel, take them away captive and destroy the cities and destroy Jerusalem, ransack the temple, take everything down, and the city will be nothing like it has been. But in the latter days... It's going to come to pass that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and peoples shall flow to it. Now, let me ask you a question. I asked you, if you go to Israel right now, is there a temple on it? A temple of the house of Jacob? A temple of the God of Jacob? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? No, there isn't. It ha this hasn't happened yet. I'm, I'm telling you guys, now I don't want to get off on a tangent, but I'm just telling you, there are people who are preterists, okay? And a, a preterist is somebody who, like, a, all of the promises of God have already been fulfilled and all of the things that the New Testament talks about, the judgment that is to come and all the stuff that's going to happen, the millennial reign of Christ and all that, they believe that all of that is fulfilled perfectly already in history, yeah, I know. It's wacky, but they believe it. And there are smart men who believe it, okay? Who are good Bible teachers, who are good theologians, and yet they believe it. And I can't understand it because to me, when I read this, and it says that this is going to happen in the latter days. Now, there's no doubt that the latter days are the days after the ascension of Jesus into heaven. That's the end times. Now, I just want you to know what happens not that long after Jesus ascends into heaven. Jesus ascends into heaven in about 33 A.D., okay? About 33 A.D. In 70 A.D., Rome, under Titus Vespasian, comes into Jerusalem and completely destroys Jerusalem. And that's when every single stone is rolled off of the Temple Mount. And the reason why they did that is because when they burned the temple, all the articles of the house of God that were made out of gold melted, and they melted all the way down in between the cracks of the stones that were built together, and they would roll each stone off of the other to collect the gold that melted in between the cracks of the stones. Every single stone rolled off the Temple Mount. So let me ask you, any time in the history since the ascension of Christ, has this happened? Has this happened where the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and peoples, all peoples, shall flow to it? No. 
The problem is, if you're a preterist and if you believe those things, then you have to take this section of Scripture and you have to allegorize it to where it doesn't mean what it actually means. It's just symbolism. It just means something. that you, It's wind talk, and you have to have a guru to understand it. The problem is, when I read this, it seems very simple for me to just read it for what it says and then believe it. That this is going to happen, that this is yet to be fulfilled, that this is future, but this is a promise of God, and all the promises of God are yes and amen, because He is a God who cannot lie, and He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That means when He says it, it has to happen. So when He says that this is going to happen, I have no problem believing that it's going to happen. It will happen. Many nations shall come and say, Come, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. The house of the God of Jacob. I love that. I love that. People, all the, all the nations of the earth, they're, they're gathered together and they're saying, listen, we got to go to Jerusalem. We got to go to the house of Jacob. We got to go and see him. Now, as we're reading through this, it might occur to you that this is not uh, a time future in the timeline of earth where we'll be here. I mean, we'll be here for this. But we're going to take a short hiatus to heaven before this happens. Because this is the millennial reign of Christ. This is when the earth is set back in order. This is when Jesus is ruling and reigning from Jerusalem with a rod of iron. That's where the house of Jacob, that's, that's where the, God, the house of the God of Jacob is. It's in Jerusalem. That's where his name dwells. That's where his holy mountain will be established above the mountains of the earth. And his perfect temple will be there. And he'll be there in person ruling and reigning. And all the people of the earth will say, man, we got to go to the house of the God of Jacob. we got to go to Jerusalem. And listen what it says. And he, who is he? The God of Jacob. The God of Jacob. The God of Jacob. Who is the God of Jacob? Yahweh, right? The I am. When Moses says, who should I say sent me? And he says, tell them I am sent you. The ego I me. The name of God. The God who, who, who led, uh, Jeru uh, led Israel out of Egypt. He led them by a pillar of fire at night and a pillar of cloud during the day. The Shekinah glory. He fed them in the wilderness with manna from the sky, water from a rock. The God who performed all these miracles. The God who sent the prophets like Micah to warn the people of Israel what was coming for them. That God will teach them. And who is that God? That's Jesus. He's the breaker. He's the Lord. He's the one that over and over and over again, the New Testament says, will be doing these things. He is the fulfillment of what was spoken of in the Old Testament. He will teach us his ways and we shall walk in his paths. I was talking to Sean about this earlier today. I was reading this section and I was saying, man, Jesus is going to be teaching the word on earth. I'm totally going to be out of a job in the millennium. Sean's still got a job. There still needs to be worship. There's still going to be worship going on. Who would listen to me when Jesus is teaching? Hopefully none of you. I'm out of a job, man. I'm just going to be sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to him teach his word. And all the nations of the earth are going to gather together there at the Mount of God, gathered together before the feet of Jesus and listening to him teach. And listen to this. They're going to walk in his ways. They're going to do it. For out of Zion, the law shall go forth and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples and rebuke strong nations afar off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And nation shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. What do you see in this world today? You see wars and rumors of wars, right? You, shall, you see pestilence, disease, sickness. You don't see this. You see a world that's full of hate, demonic power. You see a world that hates life, that hates the sanctity of marriage, that hates God and his law. Nation rising up against nation. Making new ways of war every day. But there is a time 
There's a day soon and very soon where our Lord, our King, comes back and He subdues the nations. And then they take all the weapons of warfare and they beat them into utensils for farming. There's no need for weapons anymore in the millennium. Nation shall not rise up against nation. Now listen, this is a very familiar section, right? I mean, this is familiar to most of you. You've heard these verses that they'll... Uh, Beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. In fact, all of these first five verses sound very familiar. That's because if you go to Isaiah, chapter 2, I think it is, it's almost verbatim, word for word, the same exact prophecy. And you have scholars that are arguing back and forth, well, who stole it from who? Did Isaiah take it from uh, Micah or did Micah take it from Isaiah? Who said it first? Listen, the Lord said it. The Lord said it. And, and things are established by the mouth of two witnesses. And here are these men speaking forth the word of God inspired by the same spirit saying the same thing so that you can know this is going to come to pass. So when you see the world getting crazy around you and new weapons of warfare being developed every day, you can know that there's a day soon and very soon where the wolf will lay down with the lamb. Where there's going to be no need for weapons anymore. Nation will not rise up against nation, nor shall they learn war anymore. But everyone shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree. There's going to be fruit abounding. And no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. That means you can take it to the bank. It's sure. For all, the, for all people walk in the name of his God, but we will walk in the name of the Lord, our God, forever and ever. He's saying, look, the people of the world, they're trusting in all these other gods. They're walking in the name of their gods. They're following after them. Notice you'll see it's a little g there. This is talking about false gods, idols. They're all walking in the name of their God. But, I, but Micah is saying, but we know what's going to happen. We know the Lord of hosts. We know the God above all gods, the Lord above all lords, the King of all kings. And he says that this is going to happen and soon Every single nation will come and sit at his feet and to learn and to hear from him and to be fed. And they're all going to sit under his vine and under his fig tree. So keep trusting in your gods if you want to. But we're going to walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. In that day, says the Lord, I will assemble the lame. I will gather the outcast and those whom I have afflicted. I will make the lame a remnant and the outcast a strong nation. So the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from now on, even forever. And you, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, to you shall it come. Even the former dominion shall come, the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. Now why do you cry aloud? Is there no king in it? Is there no king in your midst? Has your counselor perished? For pangs have seized you like a woman in labor. Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in birth pangs. For now you shall go forth from the city. You shall dwell in the field, and to Babylon you shall go. Listen, this is, uh, Micah is one of the first of the prophets to speak of Babylon coming in and taking away captive Jerusalem. Uh, it's, it's Micah and Isaiah, contemporaries, at the same time. They're both prophesying that a, f that a foreign nation, Babylon specifically, is going to come and take them away captive into Babylon. So he just promises them all this amazing restoration, the millennial reign of Christ, and what's going to happen in the future, in the latter days. But he's saying, but right now, this is what's coming. Like birth pangs, it's coming. Now listen, for all you moms in the room, you know that when those contractions start, you know what happens, right? They just get more powerful and closer together. More powerful and closer together. More po Listen, I've been through it four times, okay? And I'm telling you that once we start going through that, I'm ready for an epidural, me. <laughs> while, when I'm watching Shayla go through it, okay? I'm telling you. And it's, diffi it's, it's difficult to even watch, okay? And so you know once those contractions happen that there's a baby coming soon, right? It's coming. There's no stopping it. 
It's going to happen. And so he's saying, look, like the birth pangs right now, when you're going to bring forth the baby, that's what's happening. And soon you're going to be delivered, but you're going to be delivered in Zion. I mean, in Babylon. That's what's going to happen. That's where it's going to take place. That's where the baby is finally going to be delivered. As you're suffering these birth pangs, this is the end of that. This is the culmination. You're going to be carried away captive into Babylon. Into Babylon you shall go. There you shall be delivered. There the Lord will redeem you from the hand of your enemies. So even in this promise of judgment that is coming upon the house of Israel, the Lord says, but I'm going to deliver you. There, I'm going to rescue you. Even though you're going to have to suffer, I'm not forsaking you. I'll preserve a remnant, and I will save you from the hand of your enemy. Now also, many nations have gathered against you who say, Let her be defiled. Let her eye look upon Zion. But they do not know the thoughts of the Lord, nor do they understand his counsel. For he will gather them like sheaves to the, like sheaves to the threshing floor. I love that because the Lord is saying, yeah, yeah, I'm going to use nations to come against you. I'm going to use nations to judge you because of your disobedience, because of the way you've departed. I'm going to bring these foreign nations in. They're going to judge you, but they don't know, the th they don't know my thoughts. They don't understand me. I'm going to also judge them. I'm going to use them as an instrument of judgment against you and yet judge them for the way they treated you. That's the Lord. He says, look, they do not know the thoughts of the Lord, nor do they understand his counsel, for he will gather them like sheaves to the threshing floor. Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make your horn iron. I will make your strength iron, and I will make your hooves bronze. You shall be in pieces many peoples. I will consecrate their gain to the Lord and their substance to the Lord of the whole earth. Listen, now gather yourself in troops, O daughter of troops. He has laid siege against us. They will strike the judge of Israel with a rod on the cheek. So they're coming against you. It's happening. Gather yourself in troops. They're coming against you. He has laid siege against us, talking about the kings of Assyria and Babylon. And it says they will strike the judge of Israel. Even the judges of Israel will suffer shame. They're going to suffer rebuke. They're going to suffer embarrassment. They're going to get... Hit with a rod on the cheek. That's what that means. Listen to this. I love this. In verse 2, and this is where, we're, where we'll end. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth are from of old, from everlasting. Listen to that. Listen to that. Turn real quick, real quick to Revelation chapter 22. I was having a conversation the other day with someone. <clears throat> uh, well, uh, you guys have all had this conversation. Where people will say, and you'll hear guys like Bart Ehrman and critical scholars and stuff say, well, Jesus never claimed to be God. I say it all the time. It's a silly thing to say because he does over and over and over again. He claims to be God. In fact, that's why they killed him. That's why they crucified him, not for claiming to be the Messiah. It's not illegal to do that. Anyone can do that. They killed him because he made himself equal to the Father, right? Well, here in Micah chapter uh, five. You don't have to turn back there. Keep your place in Revelation 22. It says that from Bethlehem. Now listen, this is the verse that when the wise men come to Jerusalem looking for Jesus, they go to the priests, to the scribes, and say, where's the Messiah going to be born? Herod's a the, Herod is asking, and they say, well, in Bethlehem. And this is the verse that they quote. But you, Bethlehem, though you are a little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. That means for from forever, eternity past. The one who's going to come forth out of Bethlehem, he will come forth to me. That's the Lord, that's the Father in heaven speaking. That the one is going to come from Bethlehem to him, whose going forths are from old, from 
forever, from everlasting, from eternity, not from a finite position in history past, not from a place of creation, but one who is everlasting. That's Jesus, guys. Born in Bethlehem as a baby. He's coming forth unto the Father from Bethlehem. But Micah is being very careful to point out to us that he didn't start there. He comes forth as a baby in Bethlehem, but that's not where he started. Where did he start? From everlasting. He had no beginning. Then Jesus, speaking in Revelation chapter 22, verse 12, he says, And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me. To give to everyone according to his work. Listen to this. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. That's our God. That's the breaker. The one who goes before. The one who leads the house of Jacob through the gate and into green pastures. The one who's coming to redeem and gather them together into one fold like the sheep in the pasture. The one who we follow to earth in white garments. Because it's been granted to us to be arrayed in fine linen. Which are the righteous acts of the saints. It's been granted to us, gifted to us to be called the children of God. The sons and daughters of the Most High. And the one who died for us is the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. The first and the last. The same one that will rule and reign from the mount of God in Zion. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for these truths. Lord, thank you for the richness of your word. Father, I pray that we would just give heed to it, Lord, that it wouldn't just be words on a page, Lord, that it wouldn't just be a sermon preached, Lord, but it would be the living and active word of God that would pierce our hearts. Lord, that would speak to us in the quietness of our spirit. And that would bring revelation, Lord, to who we are. To who we are in you and what our job is here on earth, Lord. And what it all means and what it's all for, Lord. That it's for your glory. It's not to be comfortable. But it's to preach the kingdom. To speak your word to a lost and dying world. Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains in my hands for war and my fingers for battle. Lord, you are a high tower, a fortress, our deliverer, and our shield, the one in whom we take refuge. Go before us as we battle for your kingdom, as we battle for the hearts of men. We pray that you would receive all the honor, all the glory, forever and ever. Amen and amen. Amen. Listen, as you guys are heading out of here, uh, don't rush. Linger. Pray with each other. Let's spend time together in fellowship. Uh, If you guys have any questions about anything, remember, you can write them down. I want to remind everybody that. You can write them down and put them in the offering box. And we're going to do like a question and answer thing once a month online where we'll do a YouTube video where we answer those questions. So, uh, unless they're too hard, and then I'll just have Pastor Jim answer them, all right? You guys be blessed. Amen.